This is a reading from the Notebooks by Maria Valtorta, 1945 to 1950, September and November of 1950, Part 3, Chapter 1, Verse 8, The One Who Is to Come. In what way? Certainly not by taking on flesh again. If his return is certain, equally certain is the fact that he will never take on different flesh, since he possesses perfect flesh, eternal, glorified by the Father, from the first time he robed himself therewith. Nor will he come for a second redemption. There will not be a second redemption, for the first was sufficient and perfect. Since then, men have, have had all the elements and supernatural assistance to remain in the people of the recreated children of God and to move from recreation to supercreation, if only they want to do so. For if, as has been stated, and wisely stated, man is a capacity which God fills with himself. And if, in addition, grace is a seed which God places in the soul, or also a ray descending to illuminate and fecundate, it is logical that, if man seconds divine desires and inspirations, his capacity to contain God grows and expands the more the whole man grows in age and in the capacity to understand and will. To understand the spiritual words of God, that is, the motions God prompts in every man to lead him to ever greater justice and a desire to reach the end for which he was created. And in the same way, the seed of grace, if man seconds its growth with faithfulness to it and the practice of the law and virtues, changes from a little seed to a large plant, yielding fruits of eternal life. And the ray, the more the soul grows in grace and rises on the way of perfection, increases the brightness of its light, as happens with anyone rising from a valley towards the summit of a mountain. This capacity which expands to, in, to contain God increasingly, this plant growing as the sovereign in the garden of the soul, this ray of the eternal sun changing from a ray into an ocean of lights, the more man rises towards the Father of lights, takes man, recreated by means of the grace obtained through the merits of Christ, to his super-creation that is, to identification with Christ, by taking on a new humanity, following his example and model, a new humanity transforming man, a rational creature, into a divinized creature who thinks, speaks, and acts in a manner as similar as possible to that of his eternal master in mortal time, the, man, the manner he commanded his faithful to adopt, the disciple to be perfect, must be like his master. Luke chapter 6, verse 40. Since for twenty centuries there has been everything necessary for man to, to possess the eternal kingdom and reach the end for which he was created, there will not be a second redemption by the God-man. The man who loses grace through weakness has the means to recover it and be redeemed. As he falls on his own, so on his own he can be redeemed by using the perpetual gifts which Christ instituted for all men who wish to draw from them. And the word of the Father will not come for a second evangelization. He will not come personally, and yet he will evangelize. He will raise up new evangelizers who will evangelize in his name. They will evangelize in a new way, in keeping with the times, a new way which will not sus substantially change the eternal gospel or the great revelation, but will broaden, complete, and make them understandable and acceptable, even to those who, on account of their atheism and their incredulity regarding the last things. Footnote 392. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell, and many other revealed truths, cite the reason that they cannot believe things which they do not understand, or love beings about whom too little is known, and that little is such as to cause fear and sorrow instead of attracting and encouraging. New evangelizers. In reality, they already are, even if the world partly is unaware of them and partly attacks them, but they will be more and more numerous, and the world, after having overlooked, or mocked, or opposed them, when terror takes hold of the foolish, who now deride the new evangelizers, will turn to them so that there will be strength, hope, and light in the darkness, horror, and tempest, of ongoing persecution by the antichrists for if it is true that the end before the for if it is true 
that before the end of time, more and more false prophets, servants of the Antichrist, will arise. It is equally true that Christ the Lord will set more and more of his servants against them, raising up new apostles in places where they are least expected. And since infinite mercy, taking pity on distressed men, overwhelmed by the storm of blood, fire, persecution, and death, will have Mary, the pure star of the sea, shine upon the sea of blood and horror, and she will be the forerunner of Christ in his final coming, these new evangelizers will bear the gospel of Mary, who was truly left in the shadow by all the evangelists and apostles and disciples, whereas vaster knowledge of her would have instructed many, preventing many falls, for she is the co-redemptrix and teacher, the teacher of pure, humble, faithful, prudent, and devout life in her home and among the people of her time. She is always a teacher, down through the centuries, worthy to be all the better known, the more the world sinks towards the mire and darkness, so as to be all the more imitated in order to lead the world back to what is not darkness and mire. The times ahead will be times of war, not only materially, but above all, the war between materiality and spirit. The Antichrist will seek to drag rational creatures into the swamp of a beastly life. Christ will seek to prevent this repudiation, not only of religion, but also of reason, by opening up new horizons and ways illuminated by spiritual lights, prompting a powerful awakening of the Spirit in whoever does not openly reject it, an awakening assisted by these new evangelizers, bearing not only Christ, but the Mother of God. They will uplift the standard of Mary. They will lead people to Mary, and Mary, who was already once before the cause and source, indirect but still powerful, of man's redemption, will continue to be such. For she is the holy adversary of the wicked enemy, and her heel is destined to crush the infernal dragon perpetually, as wisdom, which has found its seat in her, is destined to defeat the heresies corrupting souls and intellects. At that time, which must inevitably come, in which the darkness will fight with the light, bestiality with the spirit, the satanic with the surviving children of God, Babylon with the heavenly Jerusalem, and the lusts of Babylon, the threefold lusts, will overflow like stinking, uncontainable waters, seeping in everywhere, even into the house of God, as already occurred and is to happen again. As has been said, <clears throat> in that time of open separation between the children of God and Satan, in which the children of God will reach a spiritual power never before attained, and those of Satan, an evil power so vast that no mind can imagine what it will really be like, the new, the new evangelization will come. The full new evangelization, which for the time being is going through its initial awakening, exposed to opposition. And it will work great miracles of conversion and perfection, and there will be great efforts by satanic hatred for Christ and the woman, but the two will be unreachable for their enemies. It would not be appropriate for or useful for them to be reached. A supreme offense against God may not be committed by striking the two who are dearest to him, his son and the mother, who in their time already suffered all the most hateful and painful offenses, but who now, having been glorified for centuries, could not be offended without an immediate, horrendous, divine, divine punishment of the offenders. For this reason, with new means, in the right way, and at the right time, the final evangelization will be carried out, and those who yearn for light and life will have them, full, perfect, and provided through a means known only to the two givers, by Jesus and Mary. Only those who choose darkness and mire, heresy and hatred for God and Mary, that is, those already dead before dying, the putrid spirits, the spirits sold to Satan and his servants, the forerunners of the Antichrist and the Antichrist himself, will have darkness and mire and torment and eternal hatred, as is proper for it to be, when he, is to who, when he who is to come does come. Chapter 1, verse 17. Jesus, in his glorified body of, an, of inconceivable beauty, is and is not different from the way he was on earth. 
He is different because every glorified body takes on a majesty and perfection which no mortals, no matter how good-looking, majestic, and perfect they are, can have. But he is not different, because the glorification of, of the flesh does not alter the traits of the person. Consequently, in the resurrection of bodies, those who were tall will be tall, those who were thin will be thin, those who were robust will be robust, and those who were blonde, blonde, and those who were dark, dark, and so on. The imperfections will disappear, though, for in the kingdom of God all is beauty, purity, health, and life, just as was established for the earthly paradise, too. And such it would have been if man had not introduced into it sin, death, and pain of every kind, from illnesses to hatred between one man and another. The earthly paradise was the material figure of what will be the heavenly paradise, inhabited by glori glorified bodies. The natural aspects of the earthly paradise will also exist in the heavenly one, that is, in the eternal kingdom, but they will exist in a supernaturalized manner. Accordingly, the sun, the moon, and the stars, which were lights of varying brightness, created by God to illuminate the dwelling of Adam, will be, will be replaced by the eternal sun, Revelation chapter 21, verse 23, by the most lovely and pure moon, and by numberless stars, that is, by God, the light, who robes Mary in his light, Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, and her foundation is the moon, and her crown the most beautiful stars in heaven, by Mary, the woman with a stellar name, who by her immaculate purity defeated Satan, by the saints, who are the stars of the new sky, the splendor of God being communicated to the just, Matthew chapter 13, verse 43, and the river watering the earthly paradise, which, since it symbolized since it symbolized the means by which humanity would be sprinkled with waters that would cleanse it of its sins and make it fertile for the birth and growth of virtues and worthy of pleasing its creator, had four arms, like the cross, from which the river of divine blood issued forth to wash, fertilize, <clears throat> and make fallen humanity pleasing to God, will be replaced by the river of living water flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, which streams through the city of God. Revelation chapter 22 verse 1 And the tree of life, also a symbol of the tree, which would have restored true life to those who had lost it, the cross, from which the most holy, life-giving fruit hung, and the medicine came for all the diseases of the self, which can cause true death, will be replaced by the trees on both sides of the, of the river, of which Revelation speaks. Chapter 22 verse 2 I said that all imperfections would disappear. The inhabitants of the heavenly Jerusalem, now having reached perfection and no longer subject to falls, <clears throat> for in the city of God, just as still impure sinners cannot enter, nothing capable of producing impurity, abomination, or deceit can enter, will be without any imperfections at all. The great sedu uh, seducer who was able to penetrate into the physical paradise will be unable to slip into the heavenly paradise. Lucifer, who plunged from heaven to the netherworld because of his rebellion, Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 15, will be buried and nullified at the end of time, before the new heaven and the new earth come, so that he can no longer act, do harm, and bring pain to those who have overcome every trial and every purification, and they will live in the Lord. There will no longer be any spiritual or intellectual imperfection then, and physical imperfections as well, which were a cross and torment, merited if proceeding from an unclean life, or unmerited if proceeding from genetic inheritance or human cruelty, will disappear. The glorified bodies of the children of God will be as they would have been if man had remained in all aspects intact as God created him, perfect in the three parts composing him, perfect as he was made by God. Jesus, the God-man, most perfect because he was God incarnate, whole because he was innocent and holy, with no damage to any part of his parts, which could be a handicap or shame, for the five wounds are gems of glory and not a mark of dishonor, so luminous in being light, like God, in being most glorious, as a most holy man, that he seemed white in his flesh, robe, and hair, 
as he became on Tabor in a cassock, for he was a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Psalm 109, verse 4. That is, by direct divine ordination, rendered such by the Father, with a golden belt, because he was eternal pontiff, will appear to everyone as he was when a man, and everyone will recognize him, just as, as he is in being most glorious, because out of obedience to love he tasted death to give life to all, and the blessed will rejoice on seeing him. I am the first and the last. As God has no beginning, so the word of God has no beginning, and yet he was a mysterious be- he has a mysterious beginning which is the one indicated by the inspired john at the start of his gospel of light in the beginning was the word this beginning without beginning with no time period serving to indicate it since for the eternal there is no temporal limit but an endless abyss of eternity what was it then it is one of the mysteries which the word himself will illuminate for souls when they are in the kingdom for everything will be illuminated and rendered knowable by means of the word, there in his eternal kingdom. But for men, for whom the flesh and exile make it impossible to penetrate the mysteries and difficult to understand them, even in the measure of what is comprehensible for those living on earth, it should be said that this beginning, with no beginning, has been since God is, and by his being he generates and loves what he generates, that is, forever. For the first one begotten from his fecund spirit with a most ardent and perfect love is his word, eternal as he is. It could be said to those most resistant to understanding that the first blazing forth of charity generated the word and produced the procession of the Holy Spirit. But since there is no first blazing forth of charity for one who is eternal, it is better to say that the perfect unity and trinity of God has had no beginning in the sense which men want to give that word, and that the mystery, in being a mystery, will be revealed to us only when we are one with God, just as Christ requested and obtained for us. Beforehand, it is useless to speak, to seek, to penetrate and know the truth of this mystery. The most ardent mystics the deepest contemplatives and the truest worshippers, though, nearly forgetting their human needs, they immerse themselves, plunge in, burn, rise and dash into that abyss of loftiness which is the divinity, to gain knowledge so as to love better and better, to implore the only object of their love, to grant them the truth, the revelation of this mystery, in order to be able to explain it to many who, in knowing it, would be attracted towards love, will never, as long as the mortal flesh robes them, be able to receive full knowledge of this mystery. It is necessary to believe through faith, pure faith, to believe without the limitations of human inquiry, to receive the truths which are proposed to us without wanting to explain them to oneself, to believe firmly, simply, and completely. The more one believes in this way, the thinner the veil over the mystery becomes, to the point where from time to time one gets the spiritual feeling that it has split open for an instant, confirming the spirit in supernatural hope of possessing God and producing a more ardent blazing of charity, which, joining us increasingly to God, fosters a new, very swift revelation of the sublime mystery, advanced relative instance of the knowledge which will form our eternal blessedness. We shall then know what here, more or less relatively, and in proportion to our life of identification with Christ, the wisdom, truth, and knowledge of the Father and of our union with the divinity we have barely glimpsed in his truth. We shall know God, this God who has always been. We shall know the Word, this Word who has always been and who is also begotten by the Father without, for this reason, having had an initial moment of generation. This Word, consubstantial with the Father, in heaven and on earth, in his human time, this word, one with the Father, and yet clearly distinct from the Father, in his person, which is not identical to that of the Father, but a specific person, and a divine person, not annulled or absent when the word took on a human person, but joined to it, through the two, though the two remain distinct in Christ, as they are distinct in the admirable 
threefold unity, a true testimony that in man, when made a son of God or a divinized creature by grace, there can be union with God, a most perfect and unique union in the Word made man, who while remaining God took on mortal flesh. A relative union, but no less true, in man, when elevated from the status of a non of a natural, rational creature to that of a divinized creature through participation in supernatural life. Now, in view of the foregoing, Jesus Christ, who will come at the proper time and in the proper way, for he is eternal, is rightly called the first and the last, the first in being and the first in instructing, initially through his word of wisdom, speaking to the patriarchs and prophets by supernatural ways, and then as the teacher for the throngs in Palestine, and still later, once again, by supernatural ways for his servants and instruments living on earth, and the last in instructing, for in heaven, for the blessed spirits, and then for the risen, he will be the word, and through the word, through Jesus, the citizens of heaven will receive the final, perfect, and complete instruction, which will make known all the truths, incomprehensible, as mysteries of faith, regarding which doctors, contemplators, and mystics have wearied themselves to gain knowledge. The Eternal Master, the first and last Master, still the Master when every school of doctors ceases to exist, a Master filling all the gaps which have remained for millennia and centuries as regards the knowledge of God, illuminating the depth of the mystery which has always remained obscure for human intellects, cancelling out the errors of every human school, and as through his first fiat, given by a master who knows perfectly how everything should be done so that it will be good, the physical creation appeared. So through his last fiat there will appear the end of all that was corrupted, and it will be judged a good thing that, in, that it no longer exists. And there will appear the new world, and all things will be established in a new, immutable way, according to his will, as a most perfect master and supreme judge, to whom the Father has entrusted every power of the kingdom of God in the heavens, of the kingdom of God in hearts, and of the judgment of all creatures, angelic, rational, or infernal, so that all in heaven, on earth, and in the netherworld will worship, know, and perceive that he is the one who is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Alpha and Omega, the Almighty.